Which second-year running back is poised to explode with a new scheme? How high should DeAndre Hopkins be going in 2021 FFPC drafts? And should you be waiting on a quarterback again in leagues this season? Plus, the 2020 FFPC main event $500,000 grand prize co-champion Jerry Hooten will hop aboard with us to talk about January drafting trips and excuse me, tips and tricks how he won a half million dollars by a half a point on the last day of the season and much more. We've got a great show for you. Daryl Elliott is here. I'm Eric Falkman. Stick around. Your high stakes fantasy football hour starts now. Broadcast live and heard around the world, you are now listening to the most entertaining hour of radio on the planet. Welcome to the High Stakes Fantasy Football Hour, presented by MyFFPC.com, with your hosts, Eric Balkman and Farrell Elliott. The High Stakes Fantasy Football Hour is your home for analysis from the best players in the world. And now, because no one else was available, here's Eric Balkman and Farrell Elliott. All our friends, please uh, thank the Hot Quiet Hollers. Remember to check out all their music at quiethollers.com. Greetings and salutations to all the Falkaholics and Ferreliacs. Welcome to the latest episode of the High Stakes Fantasy Football Hour presented by myffpc.com. I am, of course, your slightly above average host, Eric Balkman. My co-host is the definitive commissioner of fantasy football, Farrell Elliott. Farrell, I don't know about you. Um, but it has been a tough three days here in Northeast Wisconsin. Um, my local radio show up here, uh, we, we said goodbye to uh, Don Sutton, 1982 Milwaukee Brewers World Series hero. Thursday, we said goodbye to Ted Thompson, the general manager of the uh, Green Bay Packers uh, Super Bowl 45 uh, championship winning team back in 2010. And then today, we said goodbye, not just uh, us in Northeast Wisconsin, but one of the greatest uh, baseball players of all time, Hank Aaron, who played many of his years um, in Major League Baseball in Milwaukee. We said goodbye to him today. Uh, It's been rough. I'm so glad I don't have a local um, uh, show to do tomorrow because I'm worried about what Wisconsin legend I have to say goodbye to. And I don't think we need to touch on it too much tonight. Um, as far as uh, Ted Thompson goes, but he was a guy that really bucked the trend of um, achieving success in a people-driven business um, by not being very personable, which I think you can attest to. An enigma, and he frustrated agents, Balky, whether you did business with him or tried to do business with him. He was very, very frustrating, and it it, it ran counterproductive uh, to even attempt to try to get him to talk about free agency. And I often thought, oh, the Packers love to build for the draft. That was the, um, uh, the story with the Green Bay Packers. But in reality, you know, the skills to build through free agency include a, a little imagination, and you got to have some selling. And in the people business, you got to do a little marketing. You got to have the players in for visits. I, you know, uh, what it has evolved to in today to compete for free agency, Ted Thompson was just not geared that way. And it, and it's 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 very odd because you know he was hired as a scout uh, in 1992 by Ron Wolf, who could not have been a, 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 a more, an example of someone more polar opposite um, right. than Thompson. But what they instilled with each other was the Packer way. Wolf did a book later on. It was meant for business, but I always encourage everybody to read it if you want to know how a general manager thinks. Um, they they took uh, the way the Packers built the team, uh, built the football team, as a way that a businessman could build their their business. 
And, you know, it, it's, it was the way he did it, and people will argue about his success, and people will likely give that, uh, give that uh, credit. Uh, they'll, they'll find a way to, to cede some of that credit to other people in the organization. But, you know, he hired one of my all-time favorite uh, guys, Tim Terry, who's now instrumental in building the Kansas City Chiefs, and that was, that was a hire that came from, uh, from Mr. Thompson. So there you go. Good job. 23 years ago, the book came out, The Packer Way, Nine Stepping Stones to Building a Winning Organization. Uh, Ron Wolf and Paul Latner double-teamed that story. I know it's one that my father has uh, in his household. I have yet to read it, but I know that, that Farrell is right in saying that this is not the way that you build uh, an organization to be successful in professional football. This is the way you build a winning organization, period. Uh, Ted Thompson came up through that um, uh, school of thought and, and certainly, um, you know, you look back on it too, not that I want to turn this into a Ted Thompson show, but what, what mm-hmm. he did um, was, was, was um, an incredible um, achievement in talent scouting in the NFL, which is something that is pretty rare in the NFL. Um, people get stuff so wrong. So many times, and Ted Thompson did too. And and for by the way, you know, let, let's just look at this for from an analysis standpoint. Ted Thompson was incredibly successful as uh, the general manager of the Green Bay Packers in I would say like the first half of his tenure. The second half, the back half of his tenure, wasn't all that great. Um, but he did build that Super Bowl winning team in 2010. Not only through the draft, you know, his first ever draft pick was Aaron Rodgers. He had a bunch of great draft picks. Um, you know, you think about Kenny Clark, Jamal Williams, Aaron Jones, Rogers. Uh, there's plenty of guys that, that was Devontae Adams. He drafted as well. He was very successful. The second half, maybe not so much, but we know he was battling some sickness. I was treated to a bunch of stories this week when um, the Packers traded down. I want to say in the 2017 draft, they traded out of the first round. Um, they ended up um, trading the pick to the, Pits- or to the Pittsburgh Steelers who drafted T.J. Watt. Um, the Packers ended up getting Kevin King early in the second round. And that night, the night that the Packers traded back, where they didn't have any pick in the first round after they made that pick, Ted Thompson came out and talked to the Green Bay media that night. And many of the people that I know who worked that night said it almost seemed like Ted Thompson didn't realize they traded down because his, his mental health was deteriorating so much. He ended up mm-hmm. taking a, a back seat in the organization and uh, let Brian Gutekunst take over. And Brian Gutekunst has been responsible for sort of building this next Packers team that has a chance to go to the Super Bowl this coming uh, Sunday. Um, Ted Thompson, and I don't want to, you know, I'll, I'll kind of break it with this. Um, I was talking to a guy who covers the Packers, and I said, why isn't Matt LaFleur getting more coverage in coach of the year uh, when it comes to the NFL? It seems like everybody is talking about Aaron Rodgers, the MVP. Nobody's giving – Matt LaFleur, uh, coach of the year, uh, votes, um, despite him leading the Packers to back-to-back 13-3 and three wins, uh, records, and, and getting them uh, to wins all the way to the NFC Championship the last couple of years. And it's because Matt LaFleur is constantly deflecting credit. He's constantly deflecting compliments mm-hmm. in the media. And it gets to be a point where the media can't write about Matt LaFleur because he's always giving other people credit not only Ted, did Ted Thompson not talk about himself he didn't talk period um and and so we we can't really talk about what he was um in in the grand scheme of things in the NFL because not only didn't he talk about himself he didn't really talk of, about his fellow scouts the players that he drafted the free agents that he signed of which you know I've already ripped on him like you know he did sign Charles Woodson he did sign Ryan Pickett he signed players that helped the Packers win that 2010 um, a Super Bowl, and and so I, and I think that kind of goes uh, a little bit under the bridge that that we forget about. But he was yeah. responsible for some free agency signings, and because we can't really talk about Farrell, what he did as as a Packer, because he did not talk about himself, and he didn't talk a whole lot about the organization. Um, you know, period. It, it's difficult to talk about the impact that he had in Green Bay, but certainly the imprint as we look at this Packers Buccaneers game on Sunday, as we're going to talk about throughout this show, the imprint is still there. The imprint continues to be there in green Bay and Ted Thompson, although he died too young, we saw his fingerprints all over this organization for the last 20 years. 
Yeah, they'll stay there too. I uh, I want to remind everybody too as we shift our focus to fantasy football, and we don't want to turn this into a NFL football program, but best ball drafts are live with the FFPC right now. Sign up at myffpc.com. Also, go to myffpc.com slash dynasty for sale if you want to pick up some dynasty uh, fantasy football teams. And Lance Turbis, a former co-host of this show, will be on next week's Rotoviz High Stakes Lowdown. Check that out, rotoviz.com slash podcast starting Thursday morning. I want to thank Football Guys, Draft Sharks, Roto World, and Rob for tonight's fantasy flash. Let's move on and keep it within the NFC North. Talk about the Detroit Lions, Farrell. Dan Campbell is the new head coach for mm-hmm. your Detroit Lions. He actually said this week, despite not hiring an offensive coordinator, he wants to use running back DeAndre Swift more as a slot receiver. This according to Chris Burke on Twitter. Um, Dan Campbell had a very healthy, well, maybe unhealthy uh, uh, comments on, on what he envisions the uh, Detroit Lions to be over the next six years while he is in charge as the head coach. Um, he also did say he wants to get uh, he wants to get DeAndre Swift in space against linebackers. He wants to use him in the slot. DeAndre Swift was uh, the primary pass-catching running back uh, in the second half of this past season. 57 targets turned into 46 catches, 357 yards, and two touchdowns. Week 10 against Washington, he was awesome. Caught all five of his targets for 68 yards and a score. So, Farrell, as we look forward to 2021, especially when it comes to be the, um, the second-year running backs, DeAndre Swift, his arrow is pointing straight up for fantasy goodness, given uh, how Campbell wants to use him in the passing game, uh, knowing how fantasy owners in the KFFSC, knowing how fantasy owners in the FFPC want to uh, target pass-catching running backs. Looks like Swift is going to be one of them. No, it's a, it's a draft dream come true for people who believe in Swift. And, you know, he's another one of those players that finished very, very strong, Bulky. And, and Campbell has been right there to see every play and, and every effort that Alvin Kamara has made in that New Orleans Saints offense. And, you know, he's he's got to have the recency of memory. And he's, he's a journeyman player, uh, and, and those guys often make – best coaches. I mean, if you wanted something to watch in NFL television this week, this was the most entertaining press conference you could possibly get. Uh, and, you know, he's, <laughs> he's, he, he's straight out of central casting. Did you see the, did you see the full press conference? I, I just saw the, the, uh, the 35 seconds where he talked about uh, doing some very physical things. I did not watch a whole press conference, though. <laughs> you would you would have think that Hollywood had unearthed John Wayne and, and brought him back to life, <laughs> and and that, that's exactly what uh, you get. You know, this player, uh, he's had success in the league. He's been around success, both uh, as a coach and a player. Uh, and, and when he was a player, he was also part of that 0-16 uh, Detroit Lion team, so he feels the, uh, you know, he has firsthand knowledge of the, of the disappointment and and how being a Detroit Lion and how how it could uh, just uh, sprawl out of uh, all proportion with the chance to be competitive, and so he's a homegrown guy um, coming back that has contributed to football in many many different ways, and I was just very pleased. At 44 years old, to see a guy at that age get this opportunity, I think it's a good opportunity for him. Yeah, he has only been a head coach in 2015 when he was the interim for the Miami Dolphins. Mm -hmm. He's been an assistant to the head coach, to borrow my uh, office knowledge. Uh, He was the assistant (laughs) to the head coach uh, for New Orleans for the last five seasons, as well as the tight ends coach there. Be very exciting to see. You know, I was, um, you know, just – as, as everybody knows, I'm a Packers fan. I was rooting for that, for Detroit to hire the likes of Marvin Lewis, you know, these, these, uh, these uh, mm-hmm. mediocre head coaches in Detroit, you know, knowing that they would be playing against my Packers for the next several years. I think this is a good hire for Detroit and for the rest of the division, not good. We'll see what happens with Dan Campbell going forward there. Let's get into some player stuff that happened over the course of the last seven days Farrell, as it, as it uh, works out to um, fantasy football analysis, I want to kick things off with A.J. Brown in Tennessee. Terry McCormick on Twitter said that A.J. Brown has had surgery on both his knees. Now, 
Brown said back in week two, his season was supposedly going to be done, but he played through the pain all through the entire season. He get, ended up getting 70 catches for just over 1,000 yards and 11 touchdowns across 14 touchdowns. Pretty incredible the season he had if he was, in fact, supposed to miss the entire season after week two when it was originally reported as a bone bruise by the Titans. He does have several months to get back to full health. Corey Davis is going to free agency. Jonu Smith is going to free agency. A.J. Brown will be 24 years old when the season starts. Farrell, after the FFPC 2021 drafts kicked off, we have noticed that, uh, that A.J. Brown is uh, currently going as an early third-round pick as the ninth receiver off the board. Given his off-season surgery, is that a good spot for him to be at, or should we be dinging him even more than we are right now? No, those guys that are picking him in the third round are getting a significant bargain. Bucky, this is this is perhaps the, the 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 realization of this story makes me appreciate this player even more. I and now he is freed from the Arthur Smith offense, which is, which is is a very exciting opportunity to see what happens with him um, with a properly used Derrick Henry in that offense. I believe what we're going to find is, is the tight end and the other receiver, Davis, uh, return to the Titans. Um, and the quarterback is the, the quarterback is falling in line with being comfortable with the position and, and doing what's expected. I expect him to continue to grow. So in, in Brown's situation, this is about where he will go. The people are getting, the drafters are getting a huge bargain of this player. You know, what's what's so great about this guy is after he catches the ball, how he runs the ball. One of the common words bouncing around every analyst is he runs angry. Well, you know, they talk about running backs running angry. You don't hear them talking about receivers that run angry. But this player looks like a running back after he catches the ball a running back with very, very good speed and balance. I love this player. I would want to get him on every fantasy team that I have. Grab A.J. Brown now while you can, says the commish. And given how my dynasty teams have ended up going forward into the 2021 season, I am inclined to agree. Um, I have this guy everywhere. He is not uh, – his, his off-season surgeries are not enough for me to, to shy away from Brown – unlike maybe another receiver that we're going to get to a little bit later on in the program in the NFC South. Before we get to Jerry Hooten, the $500,000 grand prize winner in the FFPC main event, one other thing I do want to touch on real briefly is the Baltimore Ravens personnel decision to waive Mark Ingram, according to ESPN. If you remember, Mark Ingram signed a three-year deal. This uh, waiving comes after two years into that deal. And it's, it's kind of bizarre. Normally, we don't see big-time player releases prior to the Super Bowl, but we have seen it with our Mark Ingram this year. He is uh, subject to waivers. It's unlikely that we see anybody claim him until later on in the offseason. He was supposed to be making $5 million in 2021. That $5 million is now cap space for the Ravens as they try to formulate their team going ahead for this upcoming season with the expected lower salary cap because of uh, COVID uh, and, and no fans in the stands as, as everybody tries to get into the cap with the NFL. Um, you know, he's 31 years old. He was a healthy scratch in four games out of the last five for Baltimore this year. They already have J.K. Dobbins. They already have Gus Edwards. Farrell, as you look ahead to 2021 drafts, J.K. Dobbins is getting a lot of love among FFPC drafters being drafted at that 2-3 turn right at the end of the second round as the 12th running back selected. You know, given the fact that, that Dobbins historically has not caught a lot of passes um, in his NFL career, are you looking as Dob- at Dobbins as, as maybe a fade for you, a guy that you're not targeting at that 2-3 turn, or does he represent a value for you there? Not at that turn. And I think once some rookie players get into the league and once we have some more drafts, and once we get away from the recency bias of the playoffs, I think some of that Dobbins uh, fever will cool a little, and he'll end up being uh, drafted where I think uh, 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 up to a round later, which I think is where he should be. Uh, that's just because he hasn't been a target 
doesn't mean he can't catch the ball, but it doesn't look like uh, Baltimore, uh, their offense is designed around throwing to, to the running backs anyway. Uh, Ingram, you know, it, it, Balky, with uh, some protocols of the COVID rules, these players that were released could actually sign on with other teams. And if the Saints had won this past week, uh, he may have been reunited for a, a two-game Super Bowl run. Um, Ingram could be the uh, uh, the new uh, Uncle Frank. He could uh, mimic the Frank Gore career. It seems like he's still got health and uh, toughness and grit and ability to play the position. We haven't heard the last from Ingram. Uh, I think we've heard the last from him as a as a starting fantasy player, but he'll fill out rosters, and there'll be weeks wherever he lands that he could be uh, he could be a relevant start for you. Yeah, it seems too early to write him off entirely as a uh, as a fantasy running back, but um, not a guy certainly you want to target in leagues this year. Let's talk about targets for 2021 with uh, one of the guys you should know the most about it. I want to bring in tonight's guest right now. He's been playing fantasy football for well over three decades and the FFPC for the last seven years. He already has two national tournaments under his belt, including the 2018 FFPC Terminator, Turner, excuse me, uh, Terminator Tournament, and he finished as the runner-up this past year in that same contest as well. He's won numerous Football Guys Players Championship Leagues as well as FFPC Dynasty Leagues. And out of the 10 high-stakes best ball leagues he played in last season, he cashed in five of them. However, his biggest claim to fame is what we will talk about tonight. Please welcome the 2020 FFPC Main Event $500,000 Grand Prize winner, Jerry Hooten. Jerry, good evening to you, and congratulations, man. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was a pretty exciting evening. <laughs> we have much to, much to discuss on that because it was a it was a more exciting evening uh, for you in Week 16, perhaps than previous uh, main event champions. We're going to get into that much more. Jerry, by the way, for all the listeners out there, is in the rarefied air of appearing on the road of his high stakes lowdown prior to appearing. On the on the high stakes fantasy football hour, which he is now doing tonight, uh, and and it, and Jerry really goes to uh, to, um, to to your ilk of a fantasy player, being that you've already won the Terminator tournament. You you came in runner up this past year, but won the five hundred thousand dollars this year. You've had a lot of success uh, along with your nephew Philip. Is there a secret here, or is this just hey we grind, we work as hard as we can? And we happen to get lucky with a with a couple of lineup decisions here or there, but because of our you know studiousness to the game, we end up putting ourselves in some pretty fortunate positions. How do you explain your success in the high stakes sphere over the last you know ten years? I think uh, <laughs> well, these tournaments, all you try to do is, is just get there. You know, in the main event, you just try to get into the playoffs, try one, two, see the one league, and get into the, the tournament. And once you're in the tournament, it's 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 a lot of luck. I mean, Alvin Kamara was on my team and scored six touchdowns. You know, how many times is that going to happen? So, right. The getting in, once you get into the tournament, it's a lot of luck. But you know, you got to have some talent to get there. Um, Jerry, we are going to get into uh, plenty of of fantasy football stuff with you tonight. Before we do, can you tell the listeners what what you're doing for a living when you're not winning a half million dollars with the FFPC? Uh, My son and I own a small business, uh, pilot cars. We escort oversized loads. It's kind of different. He's a road man, Balky. You got to love a road man. (laughs) All the road men do well. Absolutely. In, 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 in fantasy football. And what about Phil? What, what can you tell us about Phil, Jay? Uh, he's been a student most of his life, and I think he's trying to get a job. So this uh, money coming in real handy for him. He's able to go buy a new car because I think his old car was kind of a clunker. So it's uh, pretty good timing for him. I love Absolutely. that. You know, it. uh yeah, I can tell. I can tell with your experience in fantasy football that you've been around the block a little bit. That you've, uh, you know, that you're you're well seasoned, as I might say that about myself. And you know, when I was growing up, uh, Balky and I talked. 
Yeah, well, you know, I'm, 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 without saying it, but, you know, we're getting there, buddy, and, and apparently you're carrying it pretty well, so I wouldn't I wouldn't let it bother you. But, uh, you know, we're, we're seeing in the news so many athletes that we grew up following that, that have passed this year. One of them, uh, my, one of my all-time favorites was the pitcher Bob Gibson from the St. Louis Cardinals. Tremendous competitor. And he wore number 45. And that became my magic number for years when I was a kid. 45 was my thing. And I, I think that's a theme. I think that's a Hooten family magic number here. Because that is the spread, I understand, that you ended up winning this half billion dollars by is 0.45 points. And you scored in the final weekend. And I had four teams last year. I never got a 200 point. 200 points would be great for me. 256.45 was your score. Now, you might have had Camara score six touchdowns, but that didn't get you all the way to 256. And I kind of believe that people – Make their own luck. So I'm appointing number 45 as the Hooten family magic number. And I want you to tell us a little bit about the magic of that weekend, how you, your nephew, your son, and whoever else was involved enjoyed those (laughs) games from kickoff Sunday until Monday night because it must have been – it must have been quite an experience that went over. Well, how do you sleep Sunday night, between Sunday and Monday night? How, how, How about that? To be quite honest with you, you know, actually that weekend was four. It was Christmas weekend. They had a game on Friday, three on Saturday, the mm. Sunday slate, the Monday night game. At yes. no time did I ever think we were going to win. We started the week at forty and forty second place, and we're just trying. You know, if we got in the top ten. We thought we were doing. You know, it was a small miracle to get there. So Camara goes and plays the the Christmas day. And scores his 56 mm-hmm. points or whatever it is. And, uh, you know, obviously that moved us up. I don't know exactly where it was. And Saturday, we had a lot of guys go Saturday. We had Waller go Saturday. Gaskin went Saturday. Some other guys I can't think of off the top of my head. Mike Evans. There was a lot of our guys went Saturday. So we, we were in first place Saturday, but we only had, like, Herbert, our defense, a kicker, and Diggs left. With a lot of games to go, and I, you know, there's no everybody's going to catch us. Sunday night, mm-hmm. I think the Packers played that Sunday night where Aaron Rodgers and Adams went off, if I remember correctly. And I thought for sure somebody was going to catch us, but they never did. Wow! I said, "Well, okay. Well, we're going into we're going into Sunday, twenty point lead, something like that." Uh, and we only had Herbert, Matt Gay. And KC going, I said, they're, they're going to catch it. They're going to blow right by it. Uh-huh. Right. Never did. <laughs> Never did. They finished up Sunday night two two points ahead. The guy was in second place. And all, okay, so that goes into Monday night. We had Diggs. He had Allen, Josh Allen, and the kicker, uh, Tyler uh, Bass. I said, you know, uh-huh. and we're two points ahead. I said, there's no way we're going to hold them, hold that off. There's just no way. And sure enough, the game starts. Allen starts throwing the ball to other people. Diggs did nothing for the first quarter and a half. He might have had one catch for, what, I don't know, three or four Very yards. Very quiet game, yeah. He threw a touchdown pass to the, the tight end. And I'm I just, at the time, I'm just thinking, okay, let's just hang on for a second. That was the whole thing all night between Philip and I. I was just, let's just hang on for a second. Take the hundred thousand and be tickled pink. And second half of the game, Diggs goes off, catches three tests, and you know every pass Allen threw was the Diggs. So we just kept gaining on this guy. The second place, get this guy. You talk about a bad beat. The guy who came in second place, I feel sorry for him. I hope he <laughs> didn't, you know, do something drastic because you talk about an ugly beat for a lot of money. I mean, you know, the last play that Allen. And Diggs played. We, you know, we get up, we, we score, score the touchdown. Phillips something on the phone with each other. Phillips says, "Hey, uh, did that put us ahead?" And I clicked the thing. I said, "Man, we're in first place." And Phillips says, "Well, he's got the kicker, the, the kicker point, you know, because the, the extra point puts them ahead." Oh so, my! So we, we, you know, I, I don't know if the kicker is in there yet or not because he had bad. 
So I hit refresh again, and you know he hit refresh, and it, number one so it kept up there all you know, for about a minute afterwards, and I said, I guess we won. Boom. <laughs> The best get, and you know, I'm sure you had to make some decisions getting to that. But I want to, I want to talk to Balky about this because I, I need some clarification here. It, it, so you have sort of recruited Phil, your nephew, to come play fantasy football with you. Is that how this went down? Yeah, it was that a, um, well, it was at my dad's funeral, his grandfather, oh. obviously, and. Um, we were just talking about our fantasy teams, and then I thought, I don't know, but it was about eight years ago. I said, uh, why don't we do a dynasty team together? Okay. All right. Well, there we go. We're off and running. And I love, from one I love a great. To, to, we, do, uh, we do over 200 teams a week of the season now. I, I love a great family story. And, Balky, you know, I have some great family members, but, you know, I never had an uncle that recruited me to play the greatest hobby in the world, fantasy football at the greatest place in the world, and lead me and help me and show me how to win my share of half a million dollars. Uh, well, what's your next, you know, what's your next move, Jerry? You, uh, a blind date with Gal Gadot? You got a little Wonder Woman <laughs> connections there or something? I mean, what else do you do for your nephews? How many other nephews do you have? Are they all jealous? Are they all standing in line? You know, you Next family function, you should have some guys uh, kind of wondering what you know when their turn's coming. You might have set a real precedent here, but congratulations, bro. Well, I appreciate that. Yeah, I'm gonna have to start hobbies with all my nephews now because they turn out as well as this one did. There you go. Congratulations, <laughs> Phil, wherever you are. I yeah, I, and I should mention too. Go ahead, Jerry. Uh, I will just I I called him and told him to be on this program, but he had. He's driving north to go up and see his mom, so he couldn't do it. Oh, there you go. Okay. Well, and and, and listen, with family first, obviously. I do want to mention, too, that um, the uh, tandem of DJ Foster and Josh Neblett came in second place. And and just following DJ's tweets um, from the night where, where you guys overtook him and, and won the whole thing, he said, missed out on $400,000 in fantasy football tonight by .45 yes less than half a point but like his tweets that 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 went on throughout throughout the the rest of the night he's like yep that's fantasy football it is what it is i can't wait to get back at it last year i'm paraphrasing a little bit but i offered nothing but congratulations to you and and phil um and and ready to get back after it in 21 as i know so many other fantasy football teams are uh team owners are including you jerry uh as as we look to uh to get uh to, to crown a new half million dollar grand prize winner in 2021. Do you look at, um, I, and I don't know how much you go into this, but when you look back at some of the lineup decisions you made or, or anything like that, the, the razor thin margin that it took for you guys to win this $500,000, were there any lineup decisions that, that you guys made or didn't make that, that maybe would have prevented you from winning this five hundred thousand dollars, Jerry, as you look back on it, um, did did you make literally every call the right way down the stretch, or were there a couple of ones that really could have cost you big? Oh, I'm feeling we probably missed something along the the weeks fourteen and fifteen, but sixteen we got right because you know we put up two fifty six. But the Saturday morning, I come driving back from grocery shopping, listening to XM radio. And uh, one of the Gaskins, I guess the guy's name is, uh, had a uh, fantasy football fantastic or whatever the program is. You know, they had a Klaskins, beat writer yeah, from Dan Indiana. Klaskins. Dan Klaskins. Yep, that's right. Klask- Dan Klaskins, fan- Fantastics on Sirius XM. Right. There you go. Listening to their program on the way home, they had a Miami beat writer on, and he threw cold water all over Gaskin, and he's in our. He was one of our players. Oh, great. So we sweated that for about two hours. He said, you know, Sullivan's going to start, which he did, and then we're going to go with the hot hand. And we had some pretty good options. We could have gone with uh, Robbie Anderson or Hooper. And that was the week that all the Brown guys, Brown wide receivers, were COVID. So kind of the buzz was, you know, Hooper was going to get a bunch of targets. And, you know, I had Robbie Anderson who had a pretty good year. So we had some viable options, but 
we talked about it and hung hard and back and said, you know what, we'll just stick with it. We'll just go with Gaskin and 39 points later. Thank you. <laughs> think long, you think. You think long is Balky's words, and I'm glad that you didn't let that uh, let that get in your head and stay in your head. You know, free agency, you talk about luck, and, and maybe you are lucky, Jerry, but I think you're just damn good at this. And one of the one of the things you can trust and, and track where a team uh, earns their uh, or earns a championship in such a competition like this is in free agency. Now you mentioned Gaskin. I think he was a free agent for you. And the quarterback from the Chargers, Justin Herbert, was a free agent for you. Which one, or maybe you can't even separate them, which one did you play the most? Which one was the most crucial for you throughout the season? All right. Excuse me. I think uh, Herbert was because our quarterback situation was terrible. So to be Mm -hmm. able to get him, you know, was big. Uh, I pretty even forget who we drafted. I think it was uh, Jones, Daniel Jones. I think that was our quarterback we took in that league. Mm-hmm. So, you know, like, so being able to get him saved us. Uh, Gaskin came in damn handy. The, you know, it's, it's one and one A, no doubt. All right, so, so Jerry, let's – and by the way, we're talking with the, uh, the $500,000 grand prize winner in the 2020 FFPC main event, Jerry Hooten who won this prize along with uh, his nephew, Philip. And, and by the way, Philip and Jerry, also 2018 FFPC Terminator champions, were uh, runners-up in that contest this year as well. Certainly have had a lot of success in the high-stakes space over the last several years. I do want to get into uh, some, some stuff going into 2021, Jerry. I know you and Philip are already involved in some best ball drafts. We'll get into that in a little bit, but... Specifically talking about DeAndre Hopkins here. He was obviously integral in your success in in 2020. Kyler Murray is continuing to get better as an NFL quarterback for the Arizona Cardinals. How many wideouts would you draft ahead of DeAndre Hopkins going forward in 2021, knowing what his situation is going to be in the NFL? Probably no more than three or four. I, you know, they, everybody was afraid when he went to Arizona, he wasn't going to get the targets. Mm. And the fact that was not the same thing with Diggs. It was the same argument with Diggs, and we got both of them. I just, you know, guys with that ballers are going to get the ball. I don't care what offense they're in, who's throwing the quarterback. They command the football. They're going to get it. That's exactly Sorry. right, Jerry. We, we talked uh, about free agency in the Green Bay Packers. Uh, this year and, and those free agency has changed so much more. The players are dictating, uh, the, you know, they have the power to choose and they're, they're, they're not, uh, they're not choosing to play in some of the glamor locations. They're making football decisions and, and uh, Hopkins, uh, Hopkins didn't have much to do with that decision, but Diggs certainly did. He wanted to be the number one guy. Let me ask you, you so you clarify that Hopkins still remains a main draft, a, a top draft pick. So I'm going to assume that Michael Thomas comes after Hopkins, but how far after Hopkins? What we learned uh, this week was uh, Thomas battled back and played hurt too. Uh, He thought that he could be on the field with Breeze for one last uh, uh, hurrah for and and run for the Super Bowl. A disappointing year for Thomas after the great year the year before. What do you do with Thomas? And where does he rate as we move forward? Well, I would definitely take Hopkins, Diggs, Metcalf. I'd put him in there with the Allen Robinson, A.J. Brown, Keenan Allen. I'd probably even take Evans over Hopkins. I think Evans and uh, Tom Brady have kind of really hooked up. I think Evans is kind of a sleeper this year, you know, high end sleeper. I think he's going to do better. But, you know, I would. I'd probably drop down to, you know, wide receiver eight, nine, something like that. You don't know who the and, quarterback and, and is. Jerry, yeah. Jerry, how much you know does the uh, no, how much does the, the knowing that, that Thomas is gonna or at least be expected to have multiple surgeries uh this off season and the fact that he is going you know, probably going to have a new quarterback next year 
are, are those the two biggest factors in bumping him down, you know, behind guys like Hopkins, Diggs, Adams, Hill, so on and so forth? Well, I mean, that doesn't help, but I think his best football is behind him. And I'm going to draft wide receivers who I think their best foot, they're in the, right at the peak of their, you know, performance, or, you know, they can take another step forward. I just think he just kind of slides behind the younger guys who might be able to take a step forward. Jerry, who is like, like our guest tonight? That's why I kind of put him in that group. I don't think those guys are going to get any better. But I would, I would like to say, Diggs, they could take another step forward. Metcalf could take a step forward. Justin Jefferson could take, you know, I think there's just some guys. Jefferson. Just, uh, mm-hmm. And and I think Jefferson is a guy we are going to be talking quite a bit about over the next several months here as as we try to ascertain how good he can be in 2021 after an immensely uh, successful uh, 2020 rookie season, uh, no question. Um, Okay, so I I want to get into some emails and chat room questions here. Um, The first one is going to come from our chat room tonight, Hudson Kern-Reeve. Jerry, I know you play uh, some dynasty fantasy football at the FFPC um, uh, Hudson is, is confronted here. He owns the 108 in one of his rookie drafts, and he has been offered Odell Beckham Jr. for that 108 pick, the eighth overall pick in rookie drafts. Where would you side on this? Would you rather have the 108, or would you rather have Odell Beckham going forward? I wouldn't touch Odell Beckham with a 10-foot pole. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> Why don't you like that? That's a bunny question is, is, is right it, there. If the guy he, wants to he, kick he, you is, back, pick 110, then I might do the trade, but that's about it. Is it just because he's getting older? Is it because he's coming off the ACL? Is it because Cleveland was very successful this year in the playoffs without him, or is it sort of all of the above, Jerry? I would just – this this draft class is loaded at wide receivers. I'd just rather take a shot with a young kid than – Deal with that circus. That's true. I, uh, it, in in back on Balky, you get a young play. You get a young mentality in an aging body. Let's get a young mentality that might grow along with the skill set. Yeah, this is a yeah. You, you, Jerry's giving HUD very very good advice. Um, and and that's the way that uh, Kern was leaning anyway, and and I told him the same thing. I, th- I think I'd rather have the 108 than than Beckham going forward for sure. So I think it is in unison. Keep that 108 over Beckham. All right, let's go to Stephen Orange, Orange Springs, Florida. Florida here. Yeah, I mean you got to ask the question um, reverse. Why does the guy want to give him up? Yeah, and, and and I think that's. You know, any any time you have to re- you receive an offer in Dynasty, I think you have to look at it from the flip side too. It's like, okay, well, why is why is this person offering me this? Why is he willing to take this in exchange for the asset that he's giving up? And I think sometimes that helps you understand things a little bit better as far as Dynasty fantasy football goes. Um, this is a Terminator question we have here from Stephen Orange Springs, Florida, Jerry. He writes, I know you guys had a lot of success in Terminator. What's something you find yourself successful at in that format that you don't necessarily see your fellow drafters doing as well? Congrats, Jerry. That is Steve in Orange Springs, Florida. So, you know, you look back over the last three years here, Jerry, you guys won the whole thing in 2018. You were the runner-up this past year. You know what you're doing in the Terminator. What do you think you're doing a little bit better than the other competitors in that uh, contest right now? Well, I'll say the same thing as I did on the when we did the program earlier. I, you got 26 spots. Now you lose one every week, but you start off with 26. You got to get 26 guys who have a role who play every week, even if it's a, a third down back, or you know, committee running back, or even like you know, a slot wide receiver. But somebody who plays every week, because you need 26 guys banging for you every week. And I, that's just the way we do it. I don't I hardly draft rookies. I, I take a rookie running back every now and again. Try to get veterans with known roles. And hopefully one of the two, three guys you draft overachieve. And, that, you know, that's how you make up the difference. Jerry, you know, you um, dig in the uh, sixth round and, and, and he, he plays like a, a first rounder. I mean, that's how you win these tournaments or get high up as you're your fifth, sixth, seventh round guy, eighth round guy, performs like a second rounder, 
and then if you get like a 12th round guy who performs like a fifth rounder, you're, you're on your way. And I think that's something important to realize too, is, is that you don't necessarily have to hit on, well, I mean, you, I mean, it, it's very important to hit on your early round picks, but the way that a lot of these national contests are won, it's those mid round picks. It's, it's those picks that are right on the cusp of the double digit round. Sometimes it's hitting on somebody late. Uh, if you're able to do that, you are uh, by, by far and away ahead of your competition, which I think you guys have really uh, exhibited over the last couple of years uh, in both of these contests, Jerry. Uh, Don in Lansing, Michigan writes, I just joined my first ever January FFPC best ball draft. Any tips for things I should be focusing on and also avoiding drafting this early in the season? That is Don in Lansing, Michigan. Jerry, I know that you and Philip are drafting early. Um, is there any pitfalls that he needs to avoid? Are there any things that he needs to focus on if he's going to build a dominant January team? Well, I go back to what I just said at the Terminator. Unless you're clairvoyant, stay away from the rookies. Who knows? Find guys you know who have a role in their offense. Try to stay with the, a guy with the same quarterback, same coach, same offensive coordinator. You know what that guy's pretty much going to do. Who knows what a rookie running back is going to do? Who knows what a rookie wide receiver is going to do? And, you know, you can't take zeros because every, every, you know, every, we won by .45, so you can't take zeros. So get guys right. who know what they're doing, or, you know, what their roles are, and stay away from the rookies. That's, that's what I do. That sounds like very, very solid advice against uh, across all formats, Bulky. I, I like the sound of that Terminator uh, idea. I, I might sign up for one of those and find myself looking up at Jerry uh, come December. But that sounds like a very uh, good time. Jerry, you, you go through a lot of draft preparation and process, and, you know, there's probably a guy that you were very, very proud to hit on, and you hit on them everywhere. When I got off – when I got off the plane in Las Vegas, hadn't been anywhere any year this year, the cab driver says, what are you doing in Las Vegas? I said, I'm here to draft A.J. Brown and Darren Waller because that's all I could think about, you know, when I got and, and And so – and I was right about those guys. I was wrong about some others. You know, who were you – who did your process lead to you being so right about, and who were you just dead wrong about? Well, I, I guess Diggs was obviously the uh, our probably our best thing yeah. we came best person we came up with. We like Waller too. He was on that team. <clears throat> uh, I just you know Diggs to me is just a baller, and he was going. Mm-hmm. I know everybody thought that Allen couldn't get the ball deep, and you know found all kinds of different reasons not to like the guy. And I just said the kid's a baller. He's just going to command the football. There's nobody else on that team who commands the football, and. We were right there. Uh, I liked Waller. I thought he was, you know, everybody didn't like him. A lot of people didn't like him either. Ah, uh, he can't get the same targets. That was the fluke. Yada yada yada. Who on that team in the passing game commands the football? Nobody but Waller. So I just say he's going to get his. He's going to get his shares. I like Hopkins. It wasn't that he was that cheap? But uh, quarterback right. Daniel Jones on that team. That team was ugly. Except, you know, Herbert bailed us out. Uh, rookie quarterback, and that was Philip gave me crap all year long. <laughs> you got a rookie quarterback. That's why like you didn't take rookie. <laughs> I love that. And you know, listen, listening to you break that down, it reminds me of something. I've had the the thrill of being an NFL player agent for thirty seven years, ever since I came out of college, and. I've watched people stay in the industry for all these years, and I've watched them come and go. And in the scouting world, when you have scouts that talk about all the things they don't like in players versus the scout that always finds something positive in a player and knows how to build on those positives and separate players by the by the positive attributes they have, those are the scouts that 37 years later are running teams or still employed. And it seems like that's the same way in fantasy football. I want to listen to guys tell me about what they like, not what they don't like or what bothers them or the uncertainty or what they're scared about. And I heard that commentary of Diggs 
uh, also. They didn't think that in deep routes that Josh Allen could get him the football, which means that they know nothing about Josh Allen. His, his arm is a howitzer. You did a great job with this. I, you've been, I can't wait to ask you my next question, but I'll seed one to Balky. Well, look, before we get into the fantasy football analysis, Jerry, do you and Philip have any plans on 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 how you're going to spend that five hundred thousand dollars? Have you earmarked um, those funds for for a, a purchase already, or is it going to be savings investment? What are what are you going to do with that cash? Um, I'm going to start uh, putting down payment on some uh, real estate in Las Vegas. I think that's a there you go. Depressed Ooh. in the housing market, and uh, I might buy some rental houses down there. I love that. I don't know. I love that. I That's going to buy a car and uh, bank the rest, I guess. I don't know. Well, yeah. listen, uh, if, you're yeah. renting, if you're renting properties in Las Vegas, uh, I'm going to hit you up here coming up in the, the latter part of this coming summer, in the early part of this coming fall, because I know I will be in need of lodging uh, when I go out there for the uh, 2021 <laughs> FFDC main event. And hopefully we'll see you out there, Jerry, no question. Before, you've been very gracious with your time, and I really appreciate all your insight. We do want to ask you one final question, or at least Farrell does, right before we let you go here tonight. It's, it's my gift of doing the show, Jerry, and with you it really is a gift. We, and Balky has a theme. He wants to look into August of 2021, September of 2021, and I want to hear who you think may be – overdrafted. Now, I'm not talking about now. I'm talking about what you think, the hype that may build to someone that that will make them overdrafted in this, this coming year. And then I want, to, I, I want to picture you wearing a Rams uniform and you're going to see a, a player that slips and, and Team Hooten comes up here and scoops and scores with a player in the double digits because I want to listen to what you say and remember because I'm going to be drafting in September too. Uh, that's right. I don't even know why I'm talking to you guys. You guys just beat me last week. That was unkind. <laughs> um, and you made us look bad in the process. You couldn't accept it, you know. Some of my hopes and dreams. Well, you, you still room. have a half. You have but Jerry, you right have out a, of the you have a half I do believe we struck a nerve. I do believe there's a nerve that's been struck. Players, <laughs> uh, I don't. I don't know have anybody I'm gonna, I'm fading, per se. I don't like Elliot Ezekiel Elliot. I guess I wouldn't. You know, I take a lot of people over him nowadays. Yeah, I don't like anybody named Elliot. I, uh, Cortland Sutton, I think could bounce back and have a. You know, I know he was hurt all last year. But here's a guy I would take look at late. DJ Chark, I think could uh, bounce back and do some do some damage. Because of two yeah, wide receivers, that kind of like late. Yeah, you never know. I mean, it's kind of a risky. I think Marquise Brown. I know he kind of came on late last year. I think that may continue. I think with with the, this quarterback getting better, I think uh, Brown's just going to get better too. Uh, some deep, I like Preston Williams as a deep sleeper. Uh, the kid in Indianapolis, I can't think of his name now. Michael Pittman, Campbell. the receiver kid. Yeah. Oh, Paris Campbell. Campbell. Paris Campbell. Oh, no, uh, Pittman. Pittman, Michael Pittman. No, I'm thinking of Campbell, Paris Campbell. Okay. I'm thinking, some, you know, some guys you can take late in best ball leagues and it'll kind of help you. Uh, the kid in uh, Detroit, Cephas. Kind of like him. Quintez Cephas, Wisconsin, former Wisconsin Badger. Absolutely. Oh, no, I don't like him now that you told me he's from Wisconsin. Yeah. <laughs> 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 no, he's, a, he's a hell of a good blocker, Jerry. He's a great blocking wide receiver. You know, you know, you the spoiled thing is, the you know, list, Bucky. It, it well, the thing is, like, you look at Detroit. Stafford could be gone. I don't know what's going to happen with Galladay. Um, but Marvin Jones could be gone. Could be completely different now that Dane Campbell's taking over. We're still waiting on an offensive coordinator there. But Cephas certainly could be, again, a late guy in best. That really helps you down the road, as as Jerry is saying here, too, with with Cephas. Despite that uh, he he played his uh, college ball at uh, at Wisconsin. Hey, if he helps you win 500000 you know, it's a hurdle. You can, you know, you can live with it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, there's plenty of college teams well, I don't like. Before you buy but, all that uh, 
Balky, I got I got I got to tell Jerry before you before you buy all that real estate and bank all that money and and uh, before Phil buys the Maserati. Uh, save a little money to come down here to Kentucky. It's not very expensive. You'll love playing down here, and you'll get to go. You'll get to go head to head with Balky, and you can let him draft his Badgers, and you can take uh, everyone else, and, and we'll see how it works out. Jerry, it's a well, win-win it's situation. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Jonathan Taylor. Jonathan Taylor was a Badger, wasn't he? He was a Badger, indeed. He was. Yep. Yeah. Well, there you go. I think that kid's going to be. Uh, Something yeah, and, and like looking at, and, and we'll get into this more at, at, at the, the last part of the show here, but Jonathan Taylor, as far as FFPC drafts that have already been going off, he has been smack dab in the middle of round one for 2021. A guy who is in the middle of round one, really at the forefront of round one as far as fantasy drafters go. It's Jerry Hooten, the FFPC main event grand prize, half million dollar uh, winner this past year in 2020. Jerry, I cannot thank you for making some time to, to come once again on, on this show to, to talk a little bit about your exploits. Give us some insight on what's going to happen in 2021. Good luck with the real estate investments in Las Vegas uh, going forward. Congratulate Phil uh, from, from both Farrell and I, uh, I as, as well as his you know impact on, on this championship winning squad. And thanks so much for hopping aboard tonight. We always like talking to you for sure. Uh, the pleasure is all mine. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Jerry. Jerry Hooten, ladies and gentlemen. He is the uh, winner of the FFPC main event uh, grand prize $500,000 uh, championship uh, along with his nephew, Philip. Always good to hear from Jerry. We heard him on the road of his high-stakes slowdown a few months ago. I am sure we'll hear him on these airwaves again given his success, no question. Farrell, I do, we, we probably only have time for one or two emails t- here tonight, and I want to get – to, to both of them if we can. Maybe a third one. We'll see what happens. Um, but I'll but go to quick. lead things off. All right, there you go. Jerry in LeGrand, Oregon. He writes, hey, Farrell and Balky, first off, thanks for helping me win my championship game in my local league. And second, are you guys done with Joe Mixon as a first or second round pick after his performance or lack thereof this season? Thanks again. I'm a listener for life. That is Jerry in LeGrand, Oregon. Um, you look at Joe Mixon where he's going in FFPC drafts right now, Farrell. He has slipped to running back 19 at the 306. Mm. Would you get on board with him in the middle of the third round knowing what his ceiling is, or is that still too rich of a price to pay for you? Well, hell yes, I would draft him in the middle of the third round. Balky, you know, everybody complains, oh, running back by committee. Mixon's going to get his 20 carries if he plays Jacksonville He'll get 25, maybe 30. That was his big game from this year. He was on pace, Balky. 70 targets if he had stayed healthy from Joe Burrow and probably more next year. I I would ask our questioner to take a look at how the Bengals improve their offensive line through free agency, through the draft. That's their intent. And so you should be drafting Nixon because he'll benefit from that. I think volume's a great point to bring up. Bernard could be gone, and then you're looking at guys like Samaje P. Ryan and Trabian Williams, who certainly aren't the most pedigreed guys in the world. You can get Joe Mixon after guys like Clyde Edwards Alaire, who, you know, God only knows what Kansas City's going to do next year with the emergence of Darrell Williams. I don't know how they're going to pre- replace Le'Veon Bell, but you're looking at him going ahead of him. Um, uh, Antonio Gibson is going ahead of him. James Robinson's going ahead of him which I guess you can make the case that Robinson should be going ahead of Mixon. But as far as first-round pedigree, as far as playing on an elite offense, which they should be next year, <laughs> bless me, with a with – a, you, uh, with a, thank you so much. With a healthy Joe Burrow and T. Higgins reaching the upper echelon of, um, of, uh, of wide receivers next year, that Cincinnati Bengals offense – might be one you want to buy into. And if you can get the lead running back in the middle third round this year, as opposed to the end of the first, which is where he had to draft Mixon last year, he becomes a buy for me as well. Let's move on and talk about uh, Tim in Garden City, New York's email. He writes, hello, gentlemen. After you saw what Patrick Mahomes, Kyler Murray, Aaron Rodgers, and more did this season, are you still willing to wait on quarterback next year like you have in years past? That is Tim in Garden City, New York. Well, and I'll, I'll preface this by saying 
Aaron Rodgers was not a high Mm -hmm. draft round pick uh, in in 2020. He was drafted as like a QB 10, QB 11, QB 12 after a a somewhat underwhelming 2019. Now, Mahomes and and Murray were up there for sure. You look at how drafts have been unfolding this year. um, You haven't seen quarterbacks taken until the uh, fourth round. That's where Mahomes is going. Then you have to wait another round. Then you see Josh Allen and Lamar Jackson going off the board, Kyler Murray also in the fifth round. And then you get to the sixth round, it's Deshaun Watson, it's uh, Dak Prescott, and then uh, Aaron Rodgers, Russell Wilson, and Justin Herbert sort of on that sixth, seventh turn. So, Farrell, knowing that you can wait and get a quarterback um, like um, Joe Burrow, Trevor Lawrence, Kirk Cousins, Matt Ryan, you can get all those guys the ninth, the tenth round on, are you still comfortable waiting on a quarterback or would you try to target one of those top eight, top nine quarterbacks in drafts this year and pay a little bit more for them? Mm, you put Cousins and Ryan in with two very attractive young players. You must, you're you going to draft at your own peril if you don't find quarterbacks that can beat the opposition with their feet or quarterbacks that have such an elite receiver core and play in special situations where they're going to have to really spin it and throw it 40 times and 45 times a game to compete. Those are the two things you should be looking for. What Balky just said at the running back position, as far as as how often you get the ball, it's the same thing about the quarterback. How often do you throw the ball? You need efficiency, and you need opportunities at the position. And if you can get a guy that can run, then you've got the magic. And that's why Deshaun Watson was at the top Three uh, was it was in the top three at almost all important passing categories this year because he has all those qualities, plus he had to play catch-up football because he was largely their the key to their team and their offensive weapon, and they were uh, trailing so often. Yeah, you, you, you get a guy with weapons, you get a guy with talent, you get a guy with a suspect defense, man, that is just the chef's kiss of quarterbacks that you want to target. <laughs> after the elite ones are off the board, and certainly Watson fit the bill. Maybe he fits the bill in 2021 like he fit the bill in 2020. I apologize if we could not get to all your emails this week. We will get to them next week as we preview the Super Bowl. Farrell, um, before we sign off, and I forgot to ask Jerry about this, do you have any predictions on uh, final scores and as far as what teams you think will be in the Super Bowl after Sunday's game? Oh, after Sunday's game, this is a this is really a tough one to call. You can jump back and forth. Uh, the lines have remained constant at three and three and a half. Uh, this was certainly I will say this about our playoff challenge. Uh, this was certainly not the matchup I was expecting because uh, I suggested uh, Tynion as as my Packer uh, if I was going to mix with other players when I could have had Adams. If I knew I was going to get the Tampa Bay defenders. Uh, they have been smoked by the double move, and the king of the double move is the wide receiver Adams, and I think that's what leads Green Bay to the the, the final touch of victory, and that's going to be such a great uh, competitive uh, offensive game. I would be interested to see if you feel the same way or if you're expecting a big Packer win. On the uh, Kansas City side, um, and with Buffalo, we're looking at a we're looking at a team that just knows how to win. And it would break my heart to see that uh, Buffalo did not come out and and keep pace with the Kansas City Chiefs and their offensive juggernaut. So there we got the juggernaut word in. But you know uh, huh. the the question here is is not the, the concussion, which he's he's clear protocol. Mahomes is going to play. You always want to be careful that you, you don't get another hit to the head and, and risk con- uh, being concussed again. But the situation with that toe, that uh, you know, that's yeah. that's what has me the most concerned because uh, quarterbacks got to have their footwork and they got to be able to, you know, they, they got to be able to uh, push uh, uh, through off the leg and through the feet. Everybody knows that, and when you when you begin to, when you when you're not able to do that, uh, those things, the element of Mahomes' passing game, which has made him famous and made him unique, uh, becomes somewhat suspect and somewhat mitigated. So the, that's my concern about the Kansas City game. I don't, I'm not particularly concerned about the running backs. 
uh, whoever plays with with Kansas City, uh, you know they got they got a great offensive coordinator and a great head coach that knows how to move the ball, even on fourth and one with a backup quarterback. Balky, what do you think of that? Well, I listen. I am with you on on uh, the the Mahomes toe thing, you know, because that would be my concern as well. I have no questions about Reed, about Hill, about Kelsey. Uh, I, I think Daryl Williams has filled in admirably at running back there yes. uh, for Kansas City as well. And that offensive line's been pretty good. Now, I, I, here's my concern with with Mahomes. We saw him gutted out with with that toe um, for a portion of the game. Can he do that for 60 minutes? Maybe, but I am leaning towards Buffalo being the healthier team, being the team with Allen and Diggs, who are sort of the the, um, AFC's version of Rodgers and Adams right now. I I feel like they are playing better football right now. Call it a gut feeling, but I I, I think Buffalo is going to find a way to upset Kansas City this week and get to the Super Bowl, even though I, I think Kansas City is the more talented team. I think Buffalo's playing at a better level and a healthier level right now. So I think they nip Kansas City by, you know, three or four points to get to the Super Bowl. As far as the NFC goes, I, I think there's going to be, a, you know, much has been made about the wind and the winter and the snow and the cold. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, that, that, that's something to be said for in Green Bay. I don't think it's going to be all that impactful. What I do think is going to be impactful is how well, uh, Tampa is able to run against this Packers rush defense that yes. has been susceptible over the course of the season. I think they do rush for well over 100 yards between Jones and Fournette. I, I do believe that Tom Brady makes some pretty incredible plays in the second half. I think the Packers are winning at halftime, but I think Brady leads this team back, and I think they take the lead in the third quarter. However, um, I, I don't think Mike Evans has a big game. I think Jair Alexander – uh, is going to do a number on him. The fact that Antonio Brown is not going to be out there, um, that means Brady's going to be counting on guys like Tyler Johnson and Scott Miller. I don't know if they're going to be able to get it done under the biggest stage. So Brady's going to be good. Rodgers is going to be great. I think the Packers pull this game out in the fourth quarter. I'm thinking like 32-25, something like that. And I think we see a Green Bay-Buffalo Super Bowl. The one thing, Farrell, I am sure of, regardless of who wins these games, all four of these teams, very deserving to get at the Super Bowl. All four of these teams are in virtual coin flips as far as how they will do. It just means that you and I and everybody else are going to be treated to two awesome conference championship uh, matchups on Sunday, and I can't wait to see them. The greatest matchup of quarterbacks and coaches that I can ever remember uh, getting down to the conference championship games. This is going to be a thrill to watch. Balky, you summed it up beautifully. And uh, it doesn't matter how it works out. We're in we're in store for a great Super Bowl, too. Yes, we are. We are indeed. And I can't wait for um, the 2021 version of the Kentucky Fantasy Football State Championship as we look forward to that and utilizing what we see in these conference championship games and in the Super Bowl to form our opinions and to draft in, uh, in those leagues as I'm looking forward to right now. You can check out all that information at kffsc.com. Farrell, can't thank you enough for hopping aboard with me on another Friday. And we will talk to you next week when we know who is going to be in the Super Bowl. We'll give a quick preview on that as well. Be good, my friend. We'll talk to you again soon. Have a great weekend, Buck. Farrell Elliott, ladies and gentlemen, you follow him on Twitter at J. Farrell Elliott. You follow the Kentucky Fantasy Football State Championship on Twitter at KFFSC. And you check out Kentucky Fantasy Football State Championship on the interwebs at kffsc.com thank you so much for hanging out with us this week on the show i want to wish a happy birthday to both josh radzak and tom yates guys who have uh, been integral in uh, the ffpc's success the football guys players championship success over the last several years both celebrating a birthday this week uh today um which is awesome to uh to always talk about as we move on through the end of this show. I want to thank Jerry Hooten. I want to thank Farrell Elliott. I want to thank the FFPC, Rob Bryce, and of course, each and every one of you for listening to this live or listening to the podcast later on. Remember, the High Stakes Lowdown will be new next week, Thursday morning with Lance Purvis. He was in the first 2021 FFPC Best Ball Draft. 
We're going to talk about his uh, his picks there. Surprising ones. We'll get into that at rotobiz.com slash podcast. Uh, also, next Friday, 10, 9 Central, the 2020 FFPC Pros versus Joe's overall champ, BitLab Mandel and Hudson Kern Reeve will be on the show. Enjoy the game. This has been another episode of the High Stakes Fantasy Football Hour, presented by MyFFPC.com. It was broadcast live and heard around the world. Balky and Farrell will be back next week with more analysis, interviews, and advice from guests much smarter than they are. Thanks for listening, and we'll talk with you again next week. the exact number in mind and by the way you can check out um uh the outro music that is um uh frederick the younger go to frederick the younger.com for all of their music as well quiet uh uh is the uh, responsible party for the intro music on the show i don't know how many episodes it's been but i've been trying to get on kern for probably you know almost since the get-go of this podcast we're now in our 10th year or we're coming up on our 10th year we almost have 500 episodes in the bank, and I'm thankful that Kern will finally be on one prior to the 500th episode celebration. So Bip Lab and Kern next week, uh, you know Hudson and Bip are going to bring the real. We're going to talk a lot of best ball stuff with them. We're going to talk a lot of fantasy football stuff with them. Guy who won, two guys who have won a lot of money in the FFPC and Kentucky over the last several years. Don't miss it. Enjoy the conference championships on Sunday. Hopefully, we're talking about my Packers in the Super Bowl uh, next week. Enjoy it, everybody. Thanks so much for listening. Bye.